Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maida Cordova. I'm a professor of English and linguistics at UFU, the Federal University of Uberlândia, which is located in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to one more session of Abralin ao Vivo Linguists Online, which is a permanent series organized by Abralin, the Brazilian Association of Linguistics. The series has the objective of promoting free access to different aspects of scientific investigation and discussion in the area of linguistics. For today's talk, I'm proud to introduce you Professor Sananjan, Professor of the Department of Linguistics at UCLA. Her research interests include intonation of phonology, prosodic typology, the role of intonation and prosody in sub-areas of linguistics, such as phonology, syntax, semantics, and sentence processing. She is also interested in phonetics and laboratory phonology, and language acquisition, reacquisition, and prosodic transfer. Among other publications, she has edited the following books prosodic typology, the phonology of intonation and phrasing, and prosodic typology, too, both published by Oxford University Press. Thank you, Professor Sananjan, for sharing your knowledge with us today by participating in Abralin Ao Vivo Linguists Online. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you for inviting me. So I will share my screen. This is it. Okay. Well, today I'll talk about word problems and intonation. So we can think about how to make a word prominent in an utterance. We can uh, maybe narrowly focusing a word, or we can make a word a little more prominent than the others, even in neutral or broad focus context, like a uh, new information versus old information, or uh, content words is more prominent than function words like that. We can also think about how word prominence is marked phonetically and phonologically. And it seems that the strategies is to marking word prominence across languages depend on word prosody and phrasal prosody. And word prosody is also known as lexical prosody, and it refers to how lexical uh, special syllable of lexical uh, in the lexicon is the marked prosodically. So we can think about stress language, or tone language, or lexical pitch accent language, or a combination of those two, meaning a language can have both stress and pitch accent, or none of the above, meaning a language can have no word prosody. You can also think about phrasal prosody, that is intonation can mark word prominent, like using pitch accent or boundary tone or both pitch accent and boundary tone or phrase accent and pitch range manipulation. So today I will first talk about typology of word prominence marking types, and then a link between prominence types, word prosody and intonation and I will introduce two languages that require a revision of the typology model. And they are Paraguayan Guarani and Parasani Arabic. And I'll end with the discussion. Yeah, first we can talk about English data. In English broad focus situation, a sentence like this, a child with asthma outgrew the condition last year, each content word tends to have a pitch accent on its stress syllable. So uh, recording, I will play. The child with asthma outgrew the condition last year. So the content word, stress syllable of the content word is all marked with these red circles. And those are prominent words than those function words, the or with. And some of them has the, the slash meaning the phrase boundaries. So typically prominence is marked by this pitch accent on the content word in the default neutral case. And in narrow focus case, see again, narrow focus case, the now this time we ask the asthma is narrowly focused. So meaning uh, the child with not different health issues, but asthma. So that sounds like this. The child with asthma outgrew the condition last year. 
So the asthma is now produced with a much higher, larger expansion uh, of the pitch range and the more sharp rising. And after that is more the de accenting and depressing, meaning all uh, continued lost their pitch accent and boundaries are gone. And so in English, the narrow focus is using still using pitch accent to mark the prominence of this word. And in broad focus, the each continent tend to be marked by a pitch accent. Then the question is then how about a language that doesn't have any stress, doesn't have any word prosody like a Korean? In broad focus condition, this, this is a sentence that has one, two, three, four, five content words. And each, set, each word tend to mark by a low tone at the beginning of the word and then high tone at the end of the word. So beginning of the word is all low tone and ending high, low tone and high tone, and then low and high. I play, the, the sentence means young -ah is going to the movie with her aunt and uncle. So play the sentence. So each word is became prominent by marking with the beginning low tone and then at the end of the high tone. And this unit, the domain of the rising tone is called accentual phrase. How about the narrow focus condition? When we're asking people to produce the uncle with the uncle narrow focus is produced with the expanded pitch range on that word and compressing pitch change after the focused word. So this relation is very similar to English, but this peak is not, not linked to any stress level because Korean doesn't have a stress. So it is still boundary tone uh, at the beginning of international uh, accentual phrase, but this higher pitch range is starting a new prosodic unit called intermediate phrase. We'll talk about later about intonation models. So Korean is different from English in marking word prominent. West Greenlandic is another language that has marking with prominence with the uh, boundary tone. So this, the sentence is the Nana makes a doll for her older sister. Mm -hmm. And in this language, this low high low melody is giving in each word and starting ending with the end of the word. So low high low, and this one, the last part is a low high low. Again, low high low at the end. I'll play the sound. Nana <laughs> Or another common melody is high low high melody. Nana angayo minut inu samik sanavok. So that's how they mark each word at this broad focus level. So if a language has stress, a word becomes prominent by a stress level carrying a pitch accent, which is one of the main components of an intonation contour. But if the language has no word prosody, or would become prominent by international tones that especially marking the edge of the word. So the word prominence is cued by intonation. And since intonation is language specific, we need to consider international phonology of each language to understand how word prominence is tonally marked and phonetically realized in each language. So I will briefly introduce the uh, autosegmental magical model of international phonology because this model is what I use to analyzing intonation of various languages. In this model, pitch contour is represented as a linear sequence of a distinctive tonal targets, such as high, low, and their combinations. And these tonal targets have two functions. They mark prominence by pitch accents on stress levels, like high star, low star. So star tone means it's a pitch accent. And boundary, they also mark boundaries of prosodic units so boundaries of high prosodic units versus low prosodic units, and they are marked by some uh, diacritics after tonal symbols. So intonation defines a prosodic structure, and the structure is schematically shown this tree. And as you see here, the highest prosodic unit marked by intonation is intonational phrase, which can have more than one intermediate phrase and marked by boundary tone. And intermediate phrase can have more than one accentual phrase and also marked by a boundary tone. And accentual phrase can have more than one word, which is also marked by final boundary tone or initial boundary tone or both. And a word can have, of course, more than one syllables and some of the syllables can be stressed and that can carry a pitch accent. Okay. So I put all in parentheses because it depends on whether a language has a stress or not that has a pitch accent, or if the language has an accentual phrase, then this will be not present. So 
uh, every language has a word and international phrase, but in the middle, whether they have an inner middle phrase or a central phrase, it depends on language and also how they are phonetically realized in how, in what tonal sequence, that's also language specific. So I briefly add a little more about the properties of each prosodic unit. So all the prosodic units are larger than a word and accentual phrase, inner middle phrase and intonation phrase are typically marked by boundary tone. And these units can be also domains of its segmental or suprasegmental phonological processes. The bigger prosodic units like international phrase and intermediate phrase boundary tones, they often mark the edge of a syntactic constituents helping syntax parsing, or they also deliver semantic and pragmatic meaning of the sentence or speaker's intention. Accentual phrase, on the other hand, is generally have one in one word and can include at most one pitch accent. So typically they don't mark any syntactic function, but what I'm saying is more marked on word boundaries. And the edge of the prosodic word, which is lower than accentual phrase level, can also be marked by international tones, but this is much uh, rarer than AP level. So in my earlier uh, a model of typology of word prominence marking, I had proposed three different categories of uh, prominence marking, head prominence marking and edge prominence marking. And then the third level is the head edge prominence marking. The first the head prominence marking is like English type. That means the language that, have, that has where the word is the head, meaning stress level or lexical pitch accent level, and that head is delivering prominence, like a, carrying a pitch accent type. And Korean type or West Greenlandic type languages that they don't have any word prosody, so they are using edge of the word uh, because they don't have a pitch accent or a head tone. And the edge tone is marked either boundary tone of accentual phrase or a prosodic word. And in a focus word comes at the edge of the larger phrase. So still they are marking the edge. And the third type is a language that where both head and edge, they are marking a word prominence by pitch accent and also by the boundary tone on its edge. So what kind of head edge prominence languages uh, look like? So I will give some examples. The first example is Bengali. And Bengali has a stress at the beginning of a word. And as you see here, each word tend to have this rising tone again, as in Korean examples. But the beginning of the low, the beginning of this rising tone, the beginning is the stress level. So it's a, not just the low, but it's a low star. So low star high, high A meaning high tone marking accentual phrase final. And low and high, um, low star high A, low star high A. So it's a sequence of accentual phrases and each one is generally marking one word. It can have more than one word, but majority of cases is one word is one AP. And the sentence, Rumu Nepali Rani Mali de Namgulu Munirakte Barini. So you see low high, low high, low high sequence. The next sentence is the when the Bengali uh, word produced in narrow focus. And in this case, it depending on the focus type. Sometimes head is uh, emphasized, sometimes the edge is emphasized. So when the uh, corrective focus or contrast focus cases, they're using different pitch accent type. So instead of the low star, they are using low star plus high. So you can, the F0 is sharply rising at the beginning of the word. And this is marking the narrow focus on that word. On the other hand, when the focus is delivered by enclitic, like a small morpheme E in this case, meaning only, and they are at the end of the word. So the, that morpheme is marking the end and the accentual phrase finite tone is emphasized. So that's having a higher peak range, pitch range. So I'll play both sentences. Monwara Romila ke nielo. Versus. Monwara Romila ke nielo. So Romila ki is meaning only apparat Romila. This one is uh, the beginning of the word accent meaning not someone else, but I brought Romila. Another language in head, head edge prominence language is Georgian. It's very similar to Bengali because this language also have a stress at the initial level of the word. So low star and then ending high A. So each word having one AP, 
rising tone and beginning is a low star and ending high. Next sentence. Manana Dalian Lama's Meomar response. So very similar to Bengali. On the other hand, French is also a head edge promise type language, but uh, in French, stress is not initial, but the, at the end of the word. So uh, final full vowel is the getting the pitch accent, and initial is just the phrasal uh, AP initial boundary tone. So the tonal, tonal pattern is very similar to Georgian or Bengali by having rising tone pattern, low, high, low, high, low, high. But now high is the pitch accent and low is the boundary tone. Marion mangera des bananes. Okay. So what's common in the edge pronouns languages and head edge pronouns languages is that they generally have a prosodic unit of a central phrase. And the AP generally has a rising tonal pattern per word. So they are pretty highly rhythmic in the tonal contour level. So tonal rhythm of intonation, which I called macro rhythm, is defined as phrase medial tonal rhythm whose unit of tone alternation is equal to or slightly larger than a word, whether the tone is coming from pitch accent or AP boundary tone or the edge tone of a prosodic unit. So here's just the comparison of um, the speech rhythm that we are familiar with, like a stress time, then syllable time. That one I call micro rhythm because the unit of the timing is very small, like a foot or a syllable or a mura. And an example here, Mary Anna loves marmalade. So this each X mark means every syllable. And the, the second layer, the second row is the marking strong syllable with the weak syllable together forming a foot. So this is the micro rhythm. And the tonal contour is a Mary Anna loves marmalade. So tonal contour of the rising falling sequence, and that is called macro rhythm. So it's a tonal melody and the unit of one rising is about one word or slightly larger than a word size. So we can briefly talk about macro rhythm of edge pronouns languages. As we met, uh, I showed earlier, the edge pronouns languages, they don't have a word pronouns. So they are typically using AP, which is a little bit larger, about word size unit with a rising pattern or sometimes they have a falling pattern. So they have a strong degree of a macro rhythm. With edge pronounced languages, they typically have a stress on the edge of the word, either beginning of the word stress, like a Bengali, Farsi, Georgian, or Tamil, or at the end of the word stress, as in French and Kiche and Turkish, these are all head edge pronounced languages. And their tonal pattern of AP is typically rising tonal pattern. So their uh, macro rhythm is pretty strong. And if the uh, stress location is not fixed like this, but variable or AP final or initial tone is variable or optional, then their uh, macro rhythm is not as strong. And how about then macro rhythm of head promise language? And it depends on what type of the common pitch accent they have and also how often a content word is pitch accented. So if the language, the most common pitch accent is the rising pitch accent, as in Spanish or Italian or Greek or Brazilian Portuguese, they have a very uh, common, commonly have a pitch accent type is the rising low plus high star or low star plus high. And mostly each word tend to, each content word tend to have a pitch accent. So their macro rhythm is strong. On the other hand, English type, or German, the high star is the most common pitch accent and most content or do get pitch accent. So they are medium level macro rhythm. But, but if like a European Portuguese, they have a high star is the most common pitch accent, but the content words are not often pitch accented. And so they have a weak macro rhythm. So I will show some examples from two different Brazilian. <laughs> so one Brazilian Portuguese, uh, Brazilian Portuguese have uh, generally have each content word that gets a pitch accent, but the pitch accent type is the rising time, low star plus high for every. So this is friend, the sentence is the brother's friend dived in the sea of Maranghao. And friend is pitch accented, brother get pitch accented and dived in sea and Maranghao. And as you see, each pitch accent has the rising, rising, 
rising and rising. Ok? The sound. O amigo do meu irmão mergulhou no mar do Maranhão. Ok, so it's a, a tonal rhythm is pretty strong, so it's a high, strong macro rhythm. On the other hand, European Portuguese tend generally have a pitch accent at the beginning of the phrase and at the end of the phrase. And in the middle, they don't change uh, F0 pitch contours. So it's very flat, high flat. O poeta cantou uma manhã angelical. So that's why they have a weak macro rhythm. So the prosodic typology table is uh, based on three parameters. Promise type, we have a head, head edge or edge. And word prosody, in each promise type, we can consider a stress type language or tone or lexical pitch accent type language and both stress or tonal, uh, tonal specification in the lexicon or none of them. So these four types of word prosody can be all under head promise language. And this, it, these are example languages. So far, we haven't found any, uh, no word prosody having head marker, which is not likely. And head edge promise language, also four types. And edge promise language, so far, we only found the language that have no word prosody, they, they are marking the edge of the word. So that's what's been currently, or in 2014, what was proposed then at that time. So in term summary, so there are three types of marking word promise, hedge, uh, head, edge, and head slash edge. And these are determined by word prosody and intonation system of a language. Tonal rhythm generated from an approximately word size unit is called a macro rhythm. And a language can have a strong macro rhythm regardless of its type of word prominence. But in general, the strength of the macro rhythm is the highest in edge prominence and followed by head edge prominence and followed by head prominence. The question is then, why and how languages use a tonal melody? And since the macro rhythm definition is the tonal rhythm generated from a word size unit, strong macro rhythm means it must help in word segmentation. Like it can help in either by uh, emphasizing the head of the word or emphasizing the edge of the word. In English, these earlier studies by Ann Cutler and her colleagues found that intonation does not serve as a cue to word segmentation, but stress is facilitating word segmentation. So they found that English listeners, they tend to segment speech at the onset of the strong syllables. So when the word is on the strong syllable matching, they are faster in uh, spotting a word. So this shows because the pitch, the head is doing more uh, work, more playing a major role in word segmentation. So they don't need to mark the edge of the word. The question is then how about word segmentation in languages that do not have a stress? So like a Korean or other head edge, especially the, in the beginning is the like a Korean type that has no uh, word prosody. They have AP, using AP to having word segmentation. So there is their experiment on the word spotting studies. Since Korean AP begins with the low tone and ends with the high tone, see word boundary or AP boundary tone is in between this high and low, so that one. So low is beginning and high ending AP, and then the next AP begins with the low tone and ending with high tone. So when the tone is high to low transition, meaning when the folding tone is put happening, then there must be a where the AP boundary happening or where's also all the boundary happens. So in that experiment, they found out that Korean listeners detected the word faster and with a higher accuracy level at this high low boundary context than any other context. And similarly, word segmentation by AP is happening in head edge promise languages like French and Japanese. In these two languages, the AP begins with the low initial and then rising. So the AP initial rising tone pattern, they helped word the segmentation in French by Welby's work and Japanese by Natasha Wono and her colleagues' work. Then the next question is why the tonal melody is more rhythmic in some languages than others. And I think it's based on how strong the head is. If the stronger 
marking of the head, and then the macrodim is weak, and weaker head, then the uh, macrodim is strong. So strong, what does mean by strong stress mean? Strong head, strong stress meaning phonologically, the language has variable, so unpredictable stress location, and the changing vowel quality happening between stress and unstressed level. And phonetically, it's strong acoustic correlates happening on stress level, so longer duration, higher amplitude, and long, a strong articulation of segments. So if there's no stress, then there's a strong macro rhythm. This suggests that there's a link between word prosody and intonation. And now we can talk about link between word prosody and intonation and word prominence type. So head edge prominence languages typically have weak stress marking. They typically have a fixed stress location, either like a beginning or a final, and weak acoustic correlates of stress. So they are using more tonal rhythm, so strong macro rhythm. And even among head prominence languages, the languages with a phonetically strong stress, like a strong amplitude or long duration, they seem to have a weaker macro rhythm than those with the phonetically weak stress. So you can think about English versus Spanish. So English have, they are both uh, head prominence languages. They both have a strong head, but the realization, phonetic realization of stress is stronger in English than Spanish. So macro rhythm is stronger in Spanish than English. Now, so the hypothesis that uh, made and predictions. The first one is languages with a strong stress use non-tonal cues to mark word prominence and do not use tones to mark word edges. This means languages with a strong stress would not have an accentual phrase. Second hypothesis is that if a language has stress, it belongs to the either head prominence language or head edge prominence type languages. So the edge prominence languages would not have stress. That's the predictions. However, those two languages that I've been currently working on provide exceptions to the hypothesis. And these are Paraguayan Guarani and Farasani Arabic. And the Paraguayan, uh, the Guarani one is based on my collaboration work with the Maria Luisa Zubizarreta and Farasani Arabic work is based on Abir Abbas and uh, my collaboration. And both of these languages have a lexical stress and they have an accentual phrase. So since they have a stress in AP, we could think they may belong to head edge promise languages. First, we'll talk about Guarani. And Guarani, which is spoken in Paraguay, which is in the middle of South America, they have a lexical stress and typically is coming at the end of a lexical item. But the location of stress in the word is changing depending on the type of the suffix. If the suffix is stressed, because some of the suffix is stressed and some of them are not, and when the stress, uh, stress suffix comes after root or stem, then the stress shifts to the last stress level of the word. So for example, here, ahota is the ho is the verb go and is stressed and adding suffix ta doesn't change the stress location. So I'm going to go. But if the suffix is a se, which is a desiderative uh, suffix, meaning uh, they have a stress, then it's shipped to the se, and means I want to go. And acoustically, stress levels are longer and louder than unstressed levels. So overall, we can say uh, Paraguayan Guarani has a strong head because the stress location is not predictable, and also acoustic realization is pretty strong too. But this Guarani has an accentual phrase defined by a tonal melody, high, high, low, high star, and high A. That means the beginning AP begins with the high and ends with the high, and the pitch accent in the middle is the tritonal pitch accent. And how they are realized, it can, this high, low, high star, uh, of course, if there are three syllables, then they all have realized high, low, high, but if there's more than that, the beginning high and final boundary high may not be realized. So those, there are different realizations depending on the length of the word and tonal context and the location of the word in a phrase. 
And I will talk about all these things by using these schematics and actual pitch track examples. So the IP inter international phrase initial position or when the wood is focused, the high low high, the control, the high star stress level is either same high as earlier high or earlier, the higher than earlier high target. So they got high low high star fully realized in this case. But in IP medial position, the most common realization is the high star is a down step. So we have this high low and then medium high and then boundary tone is clearly high, higher than the pitch accented circle. And AP final location before low boundary tone, we have either down step high star or low star it's because it just falls to the low boundary tone. Here's the, uh, some uh, speech example that showing how high low high star is aligned with the syllables. When stress is the first syllable on the A of the word, like a boy, then we, there's no uh, tone, no syllables to carry three tones. So only very commonly only low high tone is realized. I can play this sound. Boy. Okay, um, boy. And sometimes we have just the high tone, oops, high tone is realized without uh, beginning low, but low high is more common. Or in this case, as in this case, we can have high, low, high, three different uh, syllables carrying all each different tones. Omanya. Omanya. The same thing here. Petei. 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 Okay. And the last one, now we have only one syllable before stress syllable. So none is the only one syllable. So they have both high and low. Nyandure. Okay, one more time. Nyandure. And the next sentence where the nandu is the same or oh, the earlier one, the meaning is ostrich. So this is now a transinitial syllable and it shows high low clearly. So in the earlier examples, this high low could sometimes because the earlier high sometimes realize that a delayed peak can happen. So this could be some may think that high is coming from the earlier AP final delayed peak, but actually the next sentence example shows that Clearly, the an has the beginning high and low. Yandu. 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 And this example shows that the low tone is now realized on the stress level. So this low begins the, with the stress level. Omanya. Okay, omanya. Omanya. Okay. And this is high, low, high. Same. The whole sentence. Awarare. Yandu. Now, this example shows that the AP final high tone is higher than stress level. That's it. So it shows that this is higher than the stress level pitch accent. So high star, but it's higher. So Ohoma, the stress level is on Ho, and Ma is the suffix that has no stress. Okay, play. Ohoma Mercado Pe. Now, this example show the um, initial, when the AP gets longer, what happens? Because stress is toward more the end of the world. So this is the uh, penultimate stress, penultimate stress and final stress. So these are all stress levels. And the, before that is a low tone. It's all low tone preceding the stress level. And before that high tone gets higher, uh, longer and longer as the syllable number gets increases. So play the sound. Roma nyama. And five syllables. Ronyembo jama. Six syllables. Oops. Roma nyama. Ronyembo jama. Sapona. Say one more time. Six syllables. Rorambo sapona. Okay. So high tone is the ones that affected when the length gets increased. Now, this, now we talk about AP that has a syntax marking function. Most words in uh, Guarani form one AP, but when AP contains more than one word, there's more than one stress level, then the last stress level gets the pitch accent. So we can say AP is the domain of a pitch accent. So we can now say at the word level, when there are more than one stress level, like a main stem and then word or the suffix, then the last stress level suffix can get the pitch, uh, the stress. 
but at the AP level, when there are more than one word, then the, the last word and the last level, last stress level of the last word gets the pitch accent. So every AP has have to have only one pitch accent. And two words can form one AP if they are closely related in syntactic or semantic terms. And one example, noun and adjective can form one AP and complex predicate can form one AP. So first, this blonde hair, this is coming from the man with the blonde hair. This whole thing is actually a heavy noun phrase and taken only from the whole sentence. The blonde hair can form two APs. You can see this a dip. So when you see a dip, like a falling and rising, that's where the stress pitch accent happens and another dip happening. So this each hair and blonde is forming separate accentual phrase. But in another uh, case, the sentence, the same sentence were produced with the one AP of both hair and blonde together. So the, the first hair is flat high. So high, 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 and then falling and up. So it's a one AP. I'll play these two sentences. Okay, one more time. Oops. And this is one AP. Okay. Now, complex predicate is forming one AP. AP in other languages generally influenced by length of the phrase. And typically AP is three to five syllables long. And if the two words AP has longer than six syllables, the AP tends to split into two and each word forms one AP. But in Guarani, the verb and law modifier, which forms a complex predicate, they always form one AP, even in long verb phrase, unless there is an intervening emphatic accent. Law modifier is defined by Zubizarreta and Pancheva's work. The stative, predi stative predicates that specify a quality, like a well or a ugly, or the manner in which the event unfolds, as in slowly, or certain aspectual properties of the event, such as frequency, recency, and again, meaning again, yeah. Here's an example of long, 11th level long AP, because the verb tell is modified by uh, the low modifier again at verb. So tell again, the meaning of the whole sentence is, she says that you are not going to tell all again. So these other, these grammatical functions are all included in one AP. So it's a very long AP. Subject is by self-forming one international phrase. So hey. Hey, nene mumbe upaje moaisha. The whole 11. So these are not influenced by the length constraints. Now, but however, there's a difficulty in finding or locating AP boundaries because AP ends with high and begins with high, especially when AP, the stress level is away from the edge of the world, edge of the AP. In this case, Lola Be, Lola is stressed in antipenultimate syllable or initial syllable. And La is a little higher than Lo, and Be is even higher than. So these are two syllables after stress level. So Lo, La, Be is getting higher, higher. And the next AP, the stress level is four syllables away from the beginning of the word. So beginning two syllables are high, high, and then falling tone, and then up, which is the stress level. So you can see that the ending of the earlier AP final syllable and beginning of the next AP beginning syllables are all high plateau. So it's not easy to tell AP ends here or ends here because they are all high tones. Ore Lola Pero Anuama. Okay, so that's when the AP boundary is hard to tell. In narrow focus condition, the edge, both the beginning in this time is the, the focus word is at the end of the sentence. And this is the answer to WH question, who is Risa going to take care of well? And the answer is she's going to take care of her child well. So this is the narrowly focused uh, word. And the pitch accent gets pretty high. It, I mean, they are downstep, but still good, very uh, clear uh, pitch accent perception. And the beginning of the word is also raised. Okay. And also before the focused word, the pitch range get compressed. 
and the focus word have a beginning raising and the pitch accent raising. When the same sentence answering to the question is now produced with the, the focus word at the beginning of the sentence, same, same meaning, but just the location, the old order is changing. So the now pitch accent is now not down step, but simple high star and the boundary tone in this case, high A boundary tone is even higher than pitch accent. So these are all how they are making the word prominent and by having a narrow focus. And the following uh, pitch accent has very small pitch range. Now, this is the yes, no question with the focusing dog. And the question is, is Louisa going to take care of the dog well? And this is the dog in the middle of the sentence. Again, pitch accent is down step high step but it's pretty yeah higher not small low down step and beginning of the word is also pretty high and before the focus, focus the word is compressed pitch range and after that is also compressed pitch range so it's a isa wire it's a loud and then high a here and beginning high is pretty strong and this is now the answer to that question is Louisa going to take care of her dog well? And now says, no, she's going to take care of her child well. So again, at the end. Now this time, even though it is before low star, I mean low percent, the, it is simple high star, not a down step high star. So very prominent pitch accent and beginning is also a little higher than the earlier high A, which is showing that it's uh, emphasized because typically it's either the same or a little lower. But the change is, of course, not a lot. This change is very small, but this change is clearly very prominent. I think I played. The next one is the, when the, the focused one is at the beginning. And again, this is the answer to yes, no question. It's a contrastive or corrective focus. So the pitch accent is now high star and the boundary tone is now falling down again a little earlier. It's instead of higher than high star, then it's now started to fall. And it's a compressed pitch range after that. So Guarani has strong stress, but has an accentual phrase, suggesting that PG may belong to head edge pronounced language. However, the AP boundary tone is not realized when the AP is shorter than four syllables. And when two pitch accents are more than two syllables away, then AP edge is very hard to find or hard to perceive because the AP ends with high and begins with high. This suggests that the role of edge is weak in marking word prominence and the head is playing a major role in this language. And when a word is narrowly focused, both the head and the edge tones are expanded but the edge tone marking is not as consistent and the salient as the head tone. So head tone is the most playing the major role. So we can say that this language is more head marking prominence language. And AP in this language is also typologically unusual in two aspects. First, unlike other AP languages, it has a syntax function, syntactic function by marking the special complex predicate even though it's pretty long. And in that case, so it's yeah, violating or not influenced by the phrase length. Second unusual case is that the tritonal pitch accent is, is exists, but not as common, it's pretty rare. So in sum, we can say uh, Paraguay, and Guara, uh, Paraguay and Guarani is a head promise language, even though it has an accentual phrase. Next language is uh, Parasani Arabic. This language is spoken, it's a dialect of Arabic spoken about 20,000 people in the Red Sea, the island is here, about southwest of Saudi Arabia. And this language has stress, lexical stress, but the stress location is predictable based on syllable weight. So the rule says, this is very common in other Arabic dialects, stress word final if a super heavy, and super heavy means vowel is long or the vowel is short, but the consonant is the long, heavy cluster consonant. And if it's not final, then stress penalty if it's a heavy, meaning two, like long vowel or vowel and coda consonant. 
And if not, stress antipenoid if it's available. If not, wood initial. So by this weight of the syllable, we can predict where the stress is. And phonetically, since most syllables are long vowel, like long vowel or coda, so when it's long vowel, they are still pretty prominent because it's long and louder. But when they are not long, then the acoustic holes are not always strong. So stress is not as strong as in Guarani case, but it's stronger than Bengali type stress, typical head edge prominence language. Here, so Farasani, Farasani Arabic has stress in broad focus condition, but we found out that it does not carry a pitch accent. Instead, each word is beginning with the low tone and end with high tone forming a rising tone over the entire word. And sometimes they can also have more than one word still showing a rising uh, domain of the rising contour, suggests that this rising contour domain is an accentual phrase but without a pitch accent. Here's an example. So Lamiana flattered Lila. So each word, beginning two words, the last word doesn't go rise because the boundary tone of international phrase is showing that this is a declarative sentence. So beginning first word stress is in the second syllable, but it's here, but it's showing in the second word stress in the first level but the overall shape is rising. It doesn't change whether stress is the initial syllable or the second syllable or the final syllable. Yeah. Damiana Jamalan Leila. Just rising and rising and falling. And this is another example showing again, each word has the rising, rising and rising, and at the end is falling. And this data is to show that long vowel stress is pretty loud and long. This is also a long vowel. Okay, so even though it's not a uh, pitch accent, but it's long because it's a lexically long vowel. But this is Saragan, which is lexically not long vowel, just the short, short, and then heavy vowel, heavy syllable at the end. But this initial stress is, uh, initial syllable is stressed. Same thing with the Namir, initial syllable is stressed, but it's not long vowel. And if you listen to the sound, these are not, I mean, if waveform can tell you the Sa is not as loud as the, uh, the next syllable. And Namir, this vowel is A, but it's still not very loud. Rama Saragan Namir Mnil Medina. Like Saragan is very right away. It's not Saragan. Oh, one more time, I'll play one more time. Rama Saragan Namir Mnil Medina. Okay. And this is an example to showing two words can form one domain of rising tone, AP. So one AP can have more than one word. This means neighbor's sons slept. Okay. Now this example is now in narrow focus condition. So it's the same sentence as the earlier one that we saw, Lamiana flattered Laila. But this time the flatter, the verb got narrow focus, contrasted focus. And now it's a, having expanded the pitch range, but that pitch peak is happening and the stress level, ja, stress level. Lamiana jamalan lehla. One more time. Lamiana jamalan lehla. So pitch accent does appear when the word is narrowly focused, but in the default broad focus, this is the same sentence. There's no pitch accent. Lamiana jamalan lehla. So low high, low high, and low. And we also found that the focus can be marked either by pitch accent or the edge. So this is the word rania, stress is in the first syllable ra, it's a long vowel, and has the beginning syllable peak, but then they can also put peak on the high, the last syllable, high A, which is the AP final high tone, that can get emphasized. Rania Linada Mariana, Rania Linada Mariana. And the native speakers said, feel that this focusing by pitch accent is more stronger, like a more prominent meaning of the focus than edge focus, so both, even though both of them are possible. And with this uh, focusing with the pitch accent is more common than focusing by edge. So Farasani Arabic in broad focus context, the edge prominence is happening because it's all sequence of low, high, low, high, beginning low and end high. Word prominence 
meaning is not marked by a pitch accent on the stress syllable. Only the edge of the word is marked by an AP boundary tone. But in narrow focus context, both the head and edge can mark word prominence, even though head marking is more common and more powerful than the edge marking. So now, uh, combining those two language data, both Guarani and Farasani Arabic have stress, and they also have an AP, but they differ in the way they mark word prominence. First, Guarani, in broad focus condition, the AP boundary tone is not very helpful in marking the edge of the word. In narrow focus, both head and edge mark the prominence, but the hedge marking is more consistent and more prominent. So overall, the head plays a major role in marking word prominence. However, as the domain of a pitch accent, an AP marks a syntactic constituent such as the verb plus low modifier complex predicate. And by having a repeating, falling, rising tritonal pitch accent, the Guarani has a strong degree of macro rhythm. And Parasani Arabic, we can say is a hybrid system. In, they have a, a lexical stress, but the stress is predictable and its acoustic correlates are not always strong. So it could belong to head edge prominence language, but in a broad focus context, only the AP is marking word prominence. That means it belongs to edge promise type. This suggests that the edge promise type is not solely from languages with no word prosody. In a narrow focus context, this language has, they are marking focus either by the head or the edge, even though head marking is more common and stronger. Therefore, uh, the, this language belongs to an edge promise language or a head edge promise language, depending on the information structural considerations. Parasani Arabic also has a strong degree of uh, macro rhythm derived from a repetition of rising AP tones because each word has rising tone. So this is the table of that typology table that is a more uh, outlined style. So we have uh, three types of prominence type, head, head edge, and edge, and word prosody, stress, tone, or uh, lexical pitch accent, and stress or tone specification, or none of them. And in this case, we can now put Guarani in the stress language, word prosody is stress, and it's belonging to head prominence, even though it has an AP. So we make sure that this is not a head edge type, it's just head type. And Farasani Arabic can belong to head edge prominence type in narrow focus condition, but in broad focus condition is purely marking edge, even though it is a stress syllabus. I mean, even though it has stress. So this is the new raw on the edge that before didn't exist. It only had a none. Because in earlier data, we only found the language that has no stress or no pitch accent language that only they, they are marking the edge of the world. But Farasani Arabic shows that even though they have a stress, they don't have, they don't mark pitch accent. So conclusion, new data shows that a language that has strong stress can also have an accentual phrase and having an AP does not mean it is involved in marking word prominence. It also shows that a language can have two types of word prominence marking depending on the information status of a word, whether they are focused or not, and can use one of them even in the same focus condition. This suggests that we need to loosen the link between word prosody and intonation and word prominence type, because languages can use different categories of their intonation system to mark word prominence. And more research is needed to improve the model of prosodic typology. Thank you. Okay. I will stop sharing. Bye. Thank you, Professor Samanjan, for your detailed presentation. Uh, now, I would like to introduce our discussant, Professor Amalia Arvaniti, Professor and Chair of English and Linguistics at Redbud University in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Amalia. Is a phonetician and a laboratory phonologist. Her research interests is on the study of speech, especially the production and perception of intonation and rhythm. 
She was also interested in the study of speech variation, particularly in the context of diglossia and bilingualism. Professor Amalia Avenida, thank you for joining the discussion today. You can start the conversation. Uh, hi, thank you. I'm afraid I am not really prepared for this because I thought I would be introducing Sana rather than discussing the work. So um, although I have a couple of questions and I know there are several people uh, on the chat who have been waiting to uh, ask questions. Um, <clears throat> I will start the conversation with uh, a couple of related questions. That's why I think I can ask them together. Um, one is we talked about prominence and what, how is prominence marked in Korean, for example, as opposed to English. And one of the questions I have for you, Sana, is can we say that prominence is, what is prominence in this case? And can we say that prominence in Korean and prominence in English actually refer to the same thing? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in, when I say promise is uh, like close to when, how we recognize there's a word. So like a visibility of the word. So in English, we were marking by the stress, by uh, making the stress syllable prominent. That's how we know, oh, if you hear two strong stresses, then we know there are two words. But in Korean, if we hear two rising tones, we know there are two words. So because Korean doesn't have any head, we have to use the international boundary tone marking the word edges. So that's why, because accentual phrase in Korean is very similar to pitch accent in English or stress in English. So if we wanna emphasize one word over the other, then we making two word in one AP, but in English, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in English, so if we say in English, a white house, like uh, together is one phrase, yeah. then we have only one stress in white. Same thing in Korean. If we have a, a same meaning of White House in Korean mm -hmm. version, we put only we put those two together in one accentual phrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that in that's why the function of the prominence marking is very similar between stress or pitch accent and uh, accentual phrasing. Okay. Yes. And the, the, my my second and related question has to do with uh, uh, stress strength. So we talked about languages that have strong stresses or weak stresses. Now I speak one of these languages natively. And I would argue that I am much more sensitive and uh, all the other native speakers I know of Greek are very sensitive to the location of stresses. Uh, it is one of the first things that children acquire. Um, and uh, if there's anything you can do when you speak English, uh, Greek not natively and you want to uh, throw processing out of the window is to actually put the stress on the wrong syllable. So it's like even, English. Even though, yeah, it, uh, so Spanish is similar. So in, in many ways, um, <clears throat> it is much more salient. It has a higher functional load. Uh, but so what, what my question is about is how do we determine strength? Is it English is our prototype and then anybody who doesn't do stress like English, then they don't have strong stress or are we talking about how native speakers use it, but the functional load of stress is? Because these things, I assume, can affect the typology. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right, and, so, and how people mark these things. Right, so I think Greek and Spanish and English, they're all uh, strong stress cases, but I put between stress, uh, between Spanish and English, I put English a little higher because the mm. yeah, English is marking by duration and the vowel reduction. But Spanish, they don't reduce the vowel as in English, and their duration is not as much different between stressed and unstressed syllables. Mm -hmm. So phonetic, they are phonologically the same level of strength. It's not predictable, fully, not fully predictable, and it's very lexical information. So have mm -hmm. to, they have to memorize where the stress is. They have to know where the stress okay. is. But phonetic realization level, English is stronger than uh, Spanish. So because of that, Spanish is using uh, the macro rhythm stronger because they are using pitch accent typically rising, the same as Greek. So what you're suggesting is that you use it to enhance the stress contrast. So yeah, so make it, making, making the words more prominent because stress is mm -hmm. not as strong as English, they are using F0. They are using tone because they are not using duration cue as much as in English. 
So Greek, I, I can ask you, is the duration of the stress level and unstress level different a lot as in English? Or it, is very, it is very similar to Spanish, to but I wouldn't say right. this is the only thing. So uh, although traditional grammars would not tell you that you have schwas, if you actually look at Greek, and I'm sure you, if you look at Spanish, you will see that very often the unstress vowels <laughs> are, in running speech in particular, are very... Right, yeah. Uh -huh. And speaking of reduced vowels, I think we can talk about uh, Portuguese now. There are several questions on the chat. Oh, and, okay. uh, they are in Portuguese, however, so I will have to ask uh, Mayra to translate, if at all possible. She put one of these questions on the chat for me in uh, English, so I can start with that. Uh, from what I have understood from the examples from Brazilian Portuguese and European Portuguese, it seems there is a difference in terms of quantity of IPs, that is phrasal accents marked by intonation. In the summary, Professor Sanajan hypothesizes that languages use an AP to mark word prominence to compensate for the weak or lack of head marking. If this is true, is it possible to say that Brazilian Portuguese has a weak head marking, uh, a weaker head marking than European Portuguese? Mm. I don't know if that was. <laughs> I'm reading so, a translation. So, <coughs> so Brazilian uh, have a pitch accent, so it's a head marking, and uh, and the European one also by a pitch accent, so it's a still head marking, but the difference is that. The Brazilian one is the head itself is different. It's a rising pitch accent. The yeah Brazilian one and the European one is the high star, so it's a high flat. So their macro rhythm is a different. So by based on my uh, pattern about across languages, the Brazilian one, which is more rhythmic, should be using less duration cue, mm -hmm. right? Because they are using more tonal cue. So by that definition, I expect European Portuguese will have a stronger stress realization than Brazilian Portuguese. I don't know if European Portuguese have a stronger stress realization than uh, Brazilian Portuguese. That one, if you know any acoustic data, then let me know. But based on this yeah. overall pattern, that's how it looks like, yeah. Uh, I think we have some technical problem because Mayra says there are a lot of questions which I cannot see oh. in the chat. Um, I see only the one that was... Um... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are no other questions in the chat. Oh, I, okay, I okay. see a question about Persian. I don't know if Sana has um, any... Um... Question about Persian? Yes, it's a general question. How about Persian? Where does oh, it Persian, the, uh, Persian is the head Farsi, edge from, yeah. yeah, the Farsi is the head edge from its language because it has a pitch accent on the stress syllable, but it also have an AP unit and AP is marking the end of the uh, a phrase word because stress is not always the end. Sometimes like a verb stress is the initial. So in those cases, the from the stress level, which is the low high pitch extent, and its high tone stays high until the end of the AP, until the end of the, uh, the AP boundary. So in Farsi, they are marking head and the end of the AP. So it, that definitely belongs to head edge promise language. But their stress is also, I heard, is a predictable based on the, uh, the part of speech type, whether they are noun or the predicate. So the, that means their stress is not very strong and they have an AP. So it fits to the typology that I just described. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, um, is that correct? I think there are no more uh, questions. So um, I would like to say thank you very much. It's given us a lot of food for thoughts and these new examples and looking at the typology uh, and thinking about the differences between languages. Um, so thank you again, and um, I think we can uh, close the session. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank very you nice very much. You yeah. Thank you very much, Maria. And also thank you, for Abralin, for inviting me and to have this opportunity to share my research. Thank you very much. And thank you, Marira. OK, so I will just then end this session, right?
Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes.